So last time I proved the following theorem. G is a finite dimensional Lie algebra. G is semi-simple. If and only if kappa is non-degenerate. Where kappa here is the killing form. Defined on x and y and g by, by the trace. So you look at the linear maps add x and add y as endomorphisms of g and you take the trace. Uh, and we'd, well, we hadn't quite proved it. The proof uh, reduced to um, Cartan's criterion for solvability. And uh, so we've still got to prove this criterion and, and, and then, then uh, we've proved the theorem as well. So Cartan's criterion is about a linear Lie algebra, so G being a subalgebra of GL of V for some finite dimensional V. And uh, the hypothesis for that is that tau of X, Y is zero for all X and Y in G. And then it says that this G is solvable. So tau here, this is the trace form. Tau of x, y is just the trace of x composed with y. That's an endomorphism of the vector space v. Okay, so the, the killing form, uh, that's uh, the trace form for the adjoint representation of g. So we've got to prove Cartan's criterion to start with today. So the proof of this needs uh, um, kind of a rather subtle lemma. Um, so let me uh, state this lemma and then prove this lemma. Uh, so this is somehow where all of the actually non-trivial work has been pushed um, in what we're doing. Um, and, and you'll see that the proof of this is, is somehow a little bit more ingenious than, uh, than is normal in this stuff. So here's the lemma. Let S be a subspace of GL of V for finite dimensional V. Um, so I think when we apply this, S is just going to be this uh, subalgebra G. And let N be the normalizer in the Lie algebra GLV of that subspace S. So that's all X in GLV such that add X of S lies in S. Right? So the commutator of X with anything in S is another element of S. If X is some element of that normalizer, has the property that uh, tau of x, y is zero for all y in n, then x is nilpotent. Okay, so I'm gonna try and write out the proof of this, um, and you'll see it, it's, it's a little bit cunning. So let's say we've got our x given to us. I'm gonna let x be xs plus xn, be the Jordan decomposition. Of X, right, so X is just an endomorphism. Of the vector space V, and, and we talked about that at the end last time, any endomorphism of a finite dimensional vector space has this uh, Jordan decomposition as the sum of a semi simple and a nil potent endomorphism, which commute. So what we need to do in order to show that x is nilpotent is to show that the semi-simple part xs is zero. Okay, so to do this, I'm gonna um, need, to, need to descend down to the real numbers. So I'm gonna let f be the r span. Oh, so hang on, I need to, I need to diagonalize my xs first. So I'm gonna pick a basis for v so that um, the matrix of X is upper triangular uh, 
Um, and so then uh, the uh, semi-simple part will just be the, the diagonal part of that. So XS will be some diagonal matrix in that basis. Let's, let's let maybe T1 up to, to TN, TI being complex numbers, um, be that, that, that semi-simple part of um, X. And then I'm going to let F be the R span of those eigenvalues. So this is a real subspace of the complex numbers. Okay, so so it, f it's either dimension zero, dimension one, or dimension two, uh, and what we're trying to do is show that actually f is zero, so that all of those t's, all of those eigenvalues are zero, and our xs is just the zero matrix. Okay, so to show that f is zero, well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take some little f in the linear dual of that real vector space. All right, so just a, a, an R linear map from, from that uh, vector space f to the real numbers. And then to show that big F is 0, um, all we need to do is show that little f is 0. That'll do the job, right? So uh, now that I've got that little f, I'm going to look at the matrix Y, which is another diagonal matrix, another endomorphism of V, uh, where the, um, down the diagonal of Y, I've got these values f of T1 up to f of Tn. Okay, so uh, let's see if I, we can... Uh, Look at these these adjoint actions. So um, XS commutes with the IJ matrix unit. This is a calculation we've made before. So uh, the XS is this diagonal matrix. So when you left multiply by the uh, this diagonal matrix, um, you scale EIJ by TI, and when you right multiply, you scale EIJ by TJ. So that commutator is Ti minus Tj times Eij. And similarly, the commutator of Y with Eij is going to be the ith diagonal entry minus the jth diagonal entry of e, times Eij. But because F is a linear map here, that's just F of Ti minus Tj Eij. Now I'm going to pick a polynomial. Maybe we'll call it R of T in the polynomial algebra. So um, I want R of Ti minus Tj. So this polynomial evaluated at that complex number, Ti minus Tj, is going to be equal to F of Ti minus Tj, that real number. I remember f, it's a linear map to the real numbers. So this is just uh, Lagrange interpolation. Let me be clear, I want, I want this uh, property for all pairs i and j. Okay, but I, all I'm doing is I've got, a, a, for, as, as i and j vary from 1 to n, I've got all these different numbers, ti minus tj. Uh, um, I, I don't know. I mean, a lot of them are zero, right? When i equals j, those numbers are all zero. But I've got this collection of numbers, ti minus tj, for i and j between 1 and n. Um, and I'm just trying to find a polynomial which takes the values f of ti minus tj at that collection of numbers. And you, you can, of course, do that. Okay, so I really don't care, just some, some polynomial of some great big degree with that property. Okay, so then the point of this is that if you look at add xs acting on eij, that's ti minus tj eij. So if I apply this polynomial r to that endomorphism of glv, that Give that, that gives you a new endomorphism of GLV, which uh, 
sends Eij to the polynomial R of Ti minus Tj times Eij, which is, let me see if I can squeeze this in a little bit, That's the same as f of ti minus tj of eij, uh, which is exactly what add y of eij e e equals, and this is for all i and j. So this little calculation here shows that r of add xs equals add y because both endomorphisms of GLV uh, do the same thing to the basis elements, the Eijs. Okay, so we've now proved that R of add xs is add y. Next, I'm going to note that add of xs, I, I mean with brackets around the xs there, that's the same as add of x, semi-simple part. So this follows... because add of x, s is semi-simple, and add of x, n is nilpotent. Those are both statements which I proved at the very end of the lecture last time. So actually add, and of course, these guys commute. because xs and xn commute, um, and add x is add of xs plus add of xn. Therefore, add of xs is exactly the semi-simple part of the endomorphism add x of GLV, and add of xn is exactly the nilpotent part by uniqueness of Jordan decomposition. Okay, so I've now established that, and that's important because uh, this, this shows that actually this add of xs is a polynomial in add x. Right, so the, the semi-simple part of, of uh, an endomorphism, uh, part of our Jordan decomposition theorem, said that that semi-simple part can be written as a polynomial in the endomorphism add x. So here we are, add y, it's a polynomial in add x s, and add x s is a polynomial in add x. This implies that add y is a uh, polynomial maybe p of add x for some polynomial. P of T in C of T. Why do I need this? Well, you see, add X of S lies in S because X was an element of the normalizer. So that polynomial P of add X of S lies in S, but that's add Y. So this shows that y is in the normalizer too. Okay, now we're nearly there. Now our hypothesis gave us that tau of x, y is zero because x and y are both in that normalizer. So what is that? Well, uh, the matrix of X is upper triangular with T1 through Tn on the diagonal, and the matrix of Y has F of T1 through F of Tn on the diagonal. So that trace is just the sum, I equals 1 to N. Uh, so X has got Ti, Y has got F of Ti on the diagonal. Right, so these are complex numbers and these are real numbers. That's an element of that uh, real vector space F, now, if I apply the R linear map F to that, we get that 
that the sum as i goes from 1 to n f of t i all squared is 0. Now, these are just all real numbers, right? So that implies that actually f of t i is 0 for all i. So actually f is 0, and, and that's what we needed to finish the proof. I guess it's a sort of a somewhat subtle and cunning argument there. Okay, so we've proved the technical lemma. Now we can prove Cartan's criterion. And then we're all up to date on everything um, that we've done. So remember here we've got this uh, sub, uh, sub algebra G of GLV, and we're assuming that uh, the uh, trace form on G is just zero. So I'm going to apply the lemma to S being G. So we need N. Remember that was the normalizer in GLV of G. And I'm going to take X in G prime, the derived subalgebra. Okay, so I want to apply the lemma. So to apply the lemma, we need to check that tau of x, y is 0 for all y in this normalizer. Okay, we'll do that in just a second. Once we've checked that, the lemma implies that x is nilpotent. So this shows that every x in g prime is nilpotent. Hence, g prime is a nilpotent Lie algebra by Engel's theorem. And if g prime is nilpotent, we get that g is solvable automatically, right, because the derived subalgebra is nilpotent, so solvable, and so that completes the proof. Oh, except no, I've still got to check this thing here, right? I've still got just a tiny little bit of work to do, so let's finish off that little check. Um, so for here, there's there's still one little subtlety here, um, because uh, um, G prime, the derived subalgebra, is merely spanned by commutators, It's not equal to the set of commutators. It's the subspace spanned by all commutators. But uh, the uh, property we're trying to check is clearly linear in X. So actually, it suffices to prove that uh, tau of one of these commutators is 0 for all y in N. But that, by, by the associativity, the invariance of the trace form, that's x1 commutator x2 y. And now what have we got? This x1 is in G, and this x2 y, well, y is something in the normalizer, x2 is in G, so that commutator is in G as well. And uh, we're assuming that uh, tau is, is just 0 on G, so that's 0 by assumption, and, and so we're good. Okay, so there we go. We're up to date with all, all, all proofs. The main thing is we've now proved this theorem and we've proved Cartan's criterion as well. They're both useful. The theorem is, is, a, is a criterion for semi-simplicity in terms of the killing form and Cartan's criterion is a criterion for solvability in terms of the trace form on a linear Lie algebra. Okay, so those are sort of the pretty pretty much the crucial theoretical tools in understanding the structure of semi-simple Lie algebras. So here's a corollary of the results so far. A finite dimensional Lie algebra G is semi-simple if and only if it is a finite direct sum O 
of uh, simple Lie algebras. Oh, this is the place where I always use the word simple wrong, don't I? Remember, when I say simple, I mean non-abelian simple, uh, because I don't uh, consider the one-dimensional Lie algebra as a simple Lie algebra. Uh, moreover, if you have some finite direct sum of simple Lie algebras, then the ideals of G are exactly the uh, two to the n different subspaces obtained just by taking the direct sums of some of the GIs. Hence, all ideals and all quotients of a semi-simple Lie algebra are semi-simple. Uh, I guess I should explain what I mean by direct sum of Lie algebras. So I mean uh, the obvious thing where the Lie bracket is extended on each of the GIs to, to the direct sum so that uh, GI and GJ just commute with each other for I different from J. Okay, so we need to prove this using our uh, using Cartan's criterion and the criterion for semi-simplicity we've just proved. Okay, so I'm going to prove the if, if and only if part. So let's see... Um, the interesting direction is the forward direction. So suppose that G is semi-simple. I want to think about an ideal. So let N be an ideal. And really the main observation, I'm going to use it repeatedly, is that the uh, killing form on N is the restriction of the killing form on G. This just follows uh, just thinking about the definitions. Because if you have an element of N and you think about the matrix of add X, and let me see, you have to pick a basis for n and extend to a basis for g. And so if you think about such a basis and, and look at the matrix of add x, you realize that it has uh, this shape because it, because n is an ideal. Note that's just 0 down there. Any Anything in g, the commutator with x, lands you back inside n. And so if you have two guys in n and you're computing the killing form as the killing form on n, you're just computing the trace of that part. Whereas if you're looking at the restriction of the killing form, killing form on g, well, you've got all these extra zeros in that bottom diagonal, but they don't contribute anything to the trace. Okay, so if n is an ideal, then n perp, so I mean the, the, the perp with respect to the killing form, so y in g such that um, the killing form kappa x, y is 0 for all x in n. This is also an ideal of g, as is the intersection But let me see um, the um, the radical of the killing form on n is exactly n intersect n perp. 
And so this is an ideal, right? So the killing form on n intersect n perp is just this restriction of the killing form. So the killing form on n intersect n perp is just zero. Okay, now <coughs> g is semi-simple. So the adjoint representation is, is embeds g into glg, right? Because the center of g is zero. Um, so this statement that the killing form on, on n intersect n perp being zero means that uh, we can deduce that actually n intersect n perp is solvable by um, Cartan's criterion. And so we're, we're working in this linearly algebra G embedded into GLG via the adjoint representation so that this killing form is the same as the trace form for the adjoint representation. Okay, so then Cartan's criterion uh, so if, if G is uh, so, is semi-simple, it doesn't have any non-zero solvable ideals. So this shows that actually N intersect N perp is just zero. Okay, so what have we done? We've shown that, that, that for our semi-simple G, if you have an ideal N, then actually um, the... Um, Restriction of the killing form to n is non-degenerate, and uh, n perp doesn't intersect n, so that gives you a complementary subspace. In fact, this is a even. So we've shown this is a direct sum of subspaces. In fact, an orthogonal direct sum with respect to the killing form. Uh, in fact, this is a direct sum of Lie algebras. Two. Because if you look at the commutator of something in N with something in N perp, that lies in the intersection, which is zero. Okay, so, the, so G decomposes in this way as a direct sum of N and N perp. Uh, and also, we've, we've seen that the, the killing forms on N and N perp are non-degenerate. So N and n perp are themselves semi-simple Lie algebras by the theorem that we that we started from. Okay, so so there you go. If you've got a semi-simple Lie algebra, you pick an ideal, then you immediately get this uh, decomposition. G is n direct sum n perp, where both n and n perp are themselves semi-simple. So now you just keep you just kind of keep going. If, if n is simple, great. If n is not simple, well, pick a proper ideal of n and, and off you go. So it's, 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 it's easy by induction on dimension. Gives that uh, g is a direct sum of simple ideals. Okay, so that's that implication which, which we wanted. Uh, so let's go in the other direction. So now suppose G is a direct sum of simple ideals. And now you just see that the killing form on G is just the, the a direct sum of the killing forms on each gi right so this is just another kind of just just pick pick bases for each gi and ext and and uh, glue them together that gives you a basis for g and just from the definition of the killing form you see that the gram matrix of the killing form on g it just looks like the gram matrix of the killing forms on each of these gi's so this is g1 g2 and so on uh, the killing form on each GI is non-degenerate, and so this, this direct sum of killing forms is non-degenerate. So we get that G is semi-simple. Okay, so that, that's done the if and only if part. Now we've got to do the moreover. So for this, we're assuming that G is a direct sum. Of simple ideals. Uh, 
uh, let's take some ideal of G um, so uh, just as I just as I just did um, the the um, G is semi simple here so just just as we showed earlier then uh, G is then the orthogonal direct sum of n and n perp um, so uh, and each of uh, and so the killing forms on n and n perp are non-degenerate, so each of n and n perp are semi-simple. Uh, and then you just repeat, and you deduce that n is a direct sum of simple ideals of G. So it, to, to establish this, moreover, all we need to do is show that every simple ideal n of g is equal to some g i. Okay, so just, just kind of the same uh, arguments as we gave in the forward implication of the proof so far. Um, the, the, the proving this, moreover, reduces just down to checking that if n is actually a simple ideal, then it equals some of these g i's. But now if n is a simple ideal, let's think about the commutator of n and g. So the span of all commutators x, y, for x in n and y in g. Since g is a direct sum of simple ideals, you get that this is the direct sum of the commutators of n with each of these g i's. And uh, this is an ideal of n, which we're assuming is simple. But this guy right here, this commutator of n and g, it's not zero. Because if it was zero, then then n would be central, right? But um, g is semi-simple, so the center of g is zero. Okay, so since this is not zero and it's an ideal of n, hence we actually have the n and g equals n. But it's this direct sum. So this direct sum equals n. So we deduce that n g i is 0 for all but one i. And for this i, n and g i equals n. But the commutator of n and g i, it's an ideal of g i, which is simple. Uh, and so that implies that n equals g i. And OK, we're done. We've proved the corollary. OK, so uh, already you're seeing how this, this killing form is useful. The proof of this corollary, uh, it, it, it gives this rather strong result about the structure of semi-simple Lie algebras. They're just direct sums of simple Lie algebras we completely understand all ideals of semi-simple Lie algebras as a result. Okay, so um, I, 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 I kind of last time I promised that, that, that we were going to think more about Jordan decomposition in semi-simple Lie algebras. So that's kind of where we're headed. Um, but in order to do that, I need another important theorem. So we've kind of got to, uh, got to spend a little time. So, so the rest of today... And the next lecture, I need to talk about, uh, let's maybe just write up what we're going to be doing next. We're going to be proving Weyl's theorem on complete reducibility So this says that if G is a finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra, it, sh it says that the category rep G, remember that was the category of finite dimensional G modules. So finite dimensional left modules over the universal enveloping algebra. We're going to show that this is a semi-simple abelian category. 
every finite dimensional module is completely reducible. We proved that already for SL2 by, uh, well, a kind of a slightly cunning trick with, with uh, commutation relations in the universal enveloping algebra. Um, and that proof doesn't work in general for a general semi-simple Lie algebra G. So I'm going to give you another proof which works in general, and actually this proof will uh, reprove the result we already established before for SL2. Um, this proof is, is, is quite general. Um, but I, I think that, that kind of direct proof for SL2 is really preferable because it really doesn't use any of this general theory, whereas now, we, now we're kind of sitting on all of the theory we've done so far. Okay, so I'm going to just finish up today by preparing uh, uh, one, one ingredient for the proof of Weyl's theorem. So the ingredient is something called the Casimir element. So let G be a finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra. Its Casimir element is, I'm going to just use the letter Z for this, it's an element of the universal enveloping algebra of G. What element? Well, it's the, so you need to pick a basis. X1 up to Xn is a basis for G. And Y1 up to Yn is the dual basis with respect to the killing form. So I'm using implicitly here that the killing form on a semi-simple Lie algebra is non-degenerate. So you pick any old basis, you let Y be the dual basis, and then the Casimir element Z, it's this linear combination Xi, Yi, summing over the basis X and the dual basis Y. And, and so this, this is now this, this product in the associative algebra U of G. So it's a quadratic element in the universal enveloping algebra. So let me see, I should note right away Z is well defined, independent of the choice of basis. That's, I'm going to leave that as an exercise. I mean, you have to consider what happens if you switch to another basis, uh, X prime. Um, what happens to the dual basis, Y prime? And what you find is if you look at the transition matrix from X to X prime, well, the transition matrix in y to y prime is, is basically the inverse matrix. And so when you look at the, the, the sum of the xi prime, y, yi primes, uh, you find you get that matrix and it's inverse and they cancel out and you get exactly the same as the sum of the xi, yi. So that's just a sort of an exercise in change of basis sort of arguments. What I do want to prove, and, and maybe this will be where I, where I stop today, is I want to prove the following lemma. Z, the Casimir, lies in the center of that associative algebra. Actually, it's kind of quite commonplace to uh, not even write Z of U of G, but just to write capital Z of G for short, for this center of the universal enveloping algebra. It becomes quite important later on in representation theory. So little z of g, that's the Lie algebra center of the Lie algebra g, and big z of g, that means the center of the uh, universal enveloping algebra of g. Okay, so let's prove the lemma. It's just a, it's just a simple calculation. Um, so I've got my, my Casimir, the sum of the xi, yi's, in the universal enveloping algebra, I'm going to take any old element x in G, and we must show that the commutator of x with z, so this is the commutator in the 
universal enveloping algebra, so I really mean xz minus zx, is actually zero in the universal enveloping algebra. So to do this, you need to know how the commutator looks between an xi and an x. That's going to be some linear combination of basis elements. And I need to know how x commutes with this dual basis. That's going to be some linear combination of basis elements. So for some aij and bij. But uh, then you make a little calculation. x i x y j. So this is the killing form. Um, so I'm taking this linear combination and I'm taking the killing form with y j. Oh, but x j and y j are dual bases. So that just plucks out the, the coefficient a i j. But it's equal to the killing form of x i with x y j by the associativity. So that's taking this expression and taking the killing form with x i, which just plucks out the y i coefficient. So in fact, a i j equals b i j for all i and j. Okay, and then finally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate uh, the commutator of the Casimir element with this Lie algebra element x. So this is the sum over i. So let me see if I can do this. So I'm, I'm taking this, I can pull this sum out the front. I've got to take the commutator of x i y i with x. And it's going to be the uh, commutator of x i with x times y i. And then it's going to be, uh, this is still the same sum, it's going to be uh, x i and x with y i. All right, so that's just using the taking commutators as a derivation. So I, I, I have to take the commutator of x with the xi times yi, or xi times the commutator of yi with the x, and that's in the wrong place, isn't it? That should have been yi with the x. Okay, and then actually, actually you know, I, I actually really wanted it where I put it. So it really is minus, and it's x with yi. And I'm going to do one more annoying thing with my um, iPad here. I'm going to erase the i's and change them to j's because it doesn't matter what I call them. And then we're basically done, right? Because this is what the sum, this, this, this xi x, it's the sum of the ai j's, x j's, and there's the y i's. And this guy x, y, j, it's the sum of the b, i, j, y, i's, and uh, because the a, i, j's and the b, i, j's are all equal, that's simply zero, and so there's that kind of silly uh, calculation to check that the Casimir element is central. Okay, so we'll use that next time when we prove Weyl's theorem on complete reducibility.